Welcome to Central Study Hour here at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you for joining us wherever you may be watching this morning. Our first request today comes from Cameron from Arizona, and the hymn is entitled Wonderful Words of Life, hymn number 286. Let's sing it together. this time to um, welcome two people who are watching, special people, Steve and Roberta Frank from South Carolina. I know you're tuning in, and happy Sabbath. Thank you for watching. If you have a special song request, please visit, at, visit us as our, at our website at sacscentral.org. Click on the contact us link. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and of course the title of the hymn you've selected, and we'll be happy to sing it with you on an upcoming Sabbath. We move right along through our topical index under stewardship, and the song that we'll be singing today is called Son of God, Eternal Savior. We'll be singing verses one through four.
bow our heads and ask the Lord to be with us this morning. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for um, the wonderful day you've given to us. Even though it might be raining outside, you're keeping our hearts warm inside. And we pray that uh, you will be with us as we open uh, your word during Sabbath school. May the words that we hear fall like dew and refreshing rain to our hearts. And I pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit. Help us to learn more about his work in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, our Sabbath school lesson will be brought to us by Pastor Chris Buttery, Senior Pastor here at Sacramento Central, Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's good to see you all and uh, those that are tuning in, watching us from wherever you are watching us from. We're glad you're doing so. And uh, we just appreciate you tuning in each week. And uh, we want to remind you, of course, every week we have a special offer. And this week's offer is C21704. And you just need to call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org. And uh, the free offer is a copy of this presentation on CD or DVD. Make sure you let us know, give us your full address. And uh, if you want the lesson study, go to our website, click on the CSH banner. And if you want the study notes from this presentation, we will make those available for you at the same location. I wanted to just take a few moments before we go into this morning's lesson to read a couple of thank yous that have come in from our viewers. Um, this one came in this week. And it says, thank you for the Sabbath school study hour. We are blessed each week. Uh, so appreciate uh, the staff, Pastor Chris, Pastors Mike, Fred, and Michael. Blessings to you in 2007, 17 rather. Uh, Jesus is coming soon. And this was sent by Ed and Suzanne Hageyu. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but if I didn't, let me know. You've got, you got our email address. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, Ed and Suzanne, and we're thank, thankful that our programs are a blessing to you. And then just one more I'd like to share. Um, this says, please pass on to all the team there at Central Study Hour my sincere thanks for their blessed efforts in leading out. Our prayers and thoughts to all. This is from Phil White, who is in Australia. And Phil uh, is the director of Edgar Ministry. Um, you probably recall we've done a couple of meetings here and we have this huge inflatable Daniel, Daniel, two, Daniel two statue. Well, Phil White is uh, the one who designed that and we got it from Australia and uh, we put it out there when we do uh, seminars for the community. And so this is Phil writing in, thanking us for Central Study Hour and how blessed he is. And a thank you to all the team, those who are working behind the scenes. You don't get to often see those on cameras working the soundboards and uh, directing, uh, but they do an awesome job. And so thank you for acknowledging them, Phil. It's a pr privilege and a pleasure for us to share these uh, studies uh, with not only us here, but all those tuning in. What a, what a reach uh, that, uh, that God has afforded us and what a blessing that is. Well, we're going to go right into our lesson study. It's lesson number four, as we look at the personality of the Holy Spirit. And let's read together the memory text, which is taken from John 14. And this is verse 26. And it says, but the helper, this is, I'm reading from the New King James Version, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And so Jesus assured us that when he would leave, he would send us a helper. Uh, the King James Version says a comforter. And the original, in the original language, the word is in Greek is parakletos, which means helper or someone coming to the aid of somebody or standing by the side of somebody. And so uh, God has, uh, has sent through Jesus the Holy Spirit to us. So who is the Holy Spirit? Um, a little book we have in our bookshelf called Motherhood is Stranger Than Fiction. Uh, a child is grappling with the biblical idea of the Godhead about the Trinity. And uh, he's not so sure about how Jesus and the Holy Spirit are related. And so he asks his, his parents or asks his mother, you know, if Jesus is alive, what's all this about the Holy Ghost? Yes, if Jesus is alive and the Heavenly Father is well, what is all of this about the Holy Ghost? 
What this curious child expressed is at the heart of a lot of people's misunderstanding, even Christians, about the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit merely a force, the Spirit of God, uh, the mind of God? Uh, Is it an intelligence? Is it merely an influence? Uh, Or is it, or is he, a person, a personality? Now, there are various non-Trinitarian views, uh, views that don't hold to the biblical teaching of the Trinity, three in one. Um, and they generally, the non-Trinitarian views fall into two categories. And I don't want to bore you, but I, I think this is uh, certainly going to be educational uh, for you, as I, I just want to share with you different views, or um, that we're going to share a couple of the views of the non-Trinitarian views, but under those two views, there are kind of subcategories. And different Christian groups or um, different religions um, fall under those, uh, those two categories and hold to different varying views of the Holy Spirit. And I wanted to share some of that with you. Now, the, f- the two categories, the non-Trinitarian views, um, believe essentially that the Holy Spirit is separate from God the Father and God the Son and, um, and is one with them in some other sense. And so the Latter-day Saints, they take that that particular view. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The other non-Trinitarian view believes that the Holy Spirit refers to some aspect of God, uh, such as it is his spirit or an active force or his mind, or it is a term used to refer to God when he acts in a particular role. So the Holy Spirit is not a person, but is, refers to some aspect, attribute of God. Um, And this is referred to as modalism, modalism or Sabellianism or monarchianism. So the Unitarian Church and the Jehovah's Witnesses, they fall into this category. You've probably heard of the church, the Christadelphians, and they believe that the phrase Holy Spirit refers to the character of God or the mind of God, depending on the context. Uh, the Latter-day Saints. They consider that the Holy Spirit as a third individual member of the Godhead, but the term Holy Spirit can also have other meanings depending on the context. To the Latter-day Saints, the Holy Spirit has a body uh, of spirit with no flesh and with no bones, unlike the Father and the Son, who are said to be resurrected individuals, individuals with glorified, immortalized bodies of flesh and bones. It's kind of uh, interesting, isn't it? Then you've got Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe the Holy Spirit is the active, God's active force. And uh, they don't capitalize the term Holy Spirit. Now, there's uh, another religion, the Baha'i faith. You've heard of the Baha'i faith. That has the concept of the most great spirit. And uh, is seen that great spirit is seen as the bounty of God. And it's usually used to describe the descent of the Spirit of God upon the messengers or upon prophets of God. So it's similar to a biblical teaching, um, which they term as manifestations of God. And they include individuals such as Jesus received that, Muhammad received that, uh, Beho Allah, the leader of the Baha'i faith. So in Baha'i belief, the Holy Spirit is the conduit through which the wisdom of God becomes directly associated with the messenger. Um, So essentially, this idea rejects uh, the idea uh, of the the Holy Spirit um, being a part of the Godhead. Rather, the Holy Spirit is a reflection of the attributes of God. Um, The Holy Spirit in Islam, let's talk about that for just a quick moment. In 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 the Islam faith, Uh, it's an agent of divine action or communication and is commonly associated with the angel Gabriel uh, or Ruhul Quadus. But also they see the Holy Spirit as uh, the created spirit from God in which he enlivened Adam, brought Adam to life, uh, made Mary pregnant with Jesus and inspired angels and inspired prophets. So the belief of the Trinity, the belief of the Godhead that, that, there are, that, that three are one is strictly forbidden in the Quran and it's called a grave sin. Uh, the same applies to the dual, dual nature 
of God or the duality of God or Allah as they call him. Now that's in the Islam faith. How about Judaism? You would expect that maybe they might be a little closer to Christianity. Well, the idea of God as a duality or trinity in Judaism is heretical. And nonetheless, the term uh, Ruach HaKodesh, which is uh, in Hebrew, uh, Holy Spirit, is found repeatedly in the Talmudic and Mid Midrashic literature, uh, which is literature that was handed down through the centuries uh, by scribes and priests and their definitions and their thoughts regarding the law of God and his judgments, you see. In some cases, it signifies, the Holy Spirit signifies prophetic inspiration. Uh, the rabbinic Holy Spirit has a degree of personification, but it remains, and I'm quoting now, a quality belonging to God, one of his attributes. So the Holy Spirit is not God, but just simply one of his attributes. That falls under one of those two uh, non-Trinitarian views that we talked about earlier. Now, another movement that came out of Christianity is Rastafari, Rastafarianism. And it has its own unique interpretation of the Holy Spirit. Um, although there are several slight variations, they generally state that uh, an ancient, or not an ancient really, it, it was a ruler, an emperor of Ethiopia in the early 20th century, Haile Selesi is his name. They believe that uh, Haile Selesi uh, embodies God the Father and God the Son. And they call the Holy Spirit a Hola, Hola Spirit, is found within the Rasta believers and within every human being. Rastafarians or Rastas also say that the true church is the human body and that it is this church or structure that contains the Holy Spirit. So you see some elements of truth, but you see it also mixed with confusing, confusion, error, uh, man-made opinions and ideas. Question, can any of these be right? I think you know the answer. Can any of these be right? Is the Holy Spirit just an inanimate person, an influence, or just an extension of God's personality? The problem of the personality of the Holy Spirit among Christians, I think, stems from the fact that we have an easier time visualizing God the Father and God the Son. We, we, we can create images in our mind. They may not be correct, but we, we see a person, we see a form. And uh, whereas the Holy Spirit seems to be more mysterious, the Holy Spirit's invisible and it's any secret. And, uh, and therefore, his personality is questioned. The question about the Holy Spirit's personality is not merely technical, it's not merely academic, and neither is it impractical. It's, this question is highly practical for believers in Jesus. If he is a divine person, if the Holy Spirit is a divine person, and we think of him as an impersonal force, then we are robbing God, the Holy Spirit, of, of divinity, the honor, the deference that is due to him, a divine personage. And if the Holy Spirit is merely a force, then we are likely to get a hold of it and we're likely to use it. But if he is a person, then we would be in a good position to study, to know how to yield to him, to study to know how he can use us rather than us using him. Um, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is a person and uh, is not an impersonal force or, imp or presence. Personality, I'll just say this slowly, personality does not require the limits of humanity. Let me say that again. Personality does not require the limits of humanity. Just because we cannot envision the Holy Spirit in bodily form does not make him less a person of the Godhead. It doesn't require, personality doesn't require the limits of humanity. Personality doesn't. Uh, there are four things that are predicated of personality. And let me just share those with you. Number one is will. Will. Number two is intelligence. Number three is power, and number four is love. So anything that has personality has a will, has intelligence, has power, and has love. And so therefore, personality involves a self-conscious, self-knowing, self-willing, 
and self-determining being. And so the question is, does the Holy Spirit measure up to, uh, to the idea of personality? Is the Holy Spirit a personality? Is he self-knowing? Uh, is he self-conscious? Is he self-willing? Is he self-determining? Does the Holy Spirit measure up? So let's take a look here in our study uh, this morning. And uh, we're going to roll through the lesson. I'm not going to highlight the days. We're just going to you're going to kind of go from one point to the next and put this all in an entire package. All right. Somebody has for me John chapter 16, verse 14. Um, and we're going to have you read that in just a little moment. Just stand by. Every Christian, or at least I should say the early Christian believers, viewed the Holy Spirit as a person. They believed he, had a person, he was a personality. He was a person. In Acts chapter 15, verse 28, where you have, the, uh, you have the Jerusalem council, God's people coming together, trying to figure out uh, some issues that were going on in the early church. Uh, as they were coming to a decision, the believers said, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. As they were arriving at a favorable and positive conclusion, they said it seemed good to us and it also seemed good to the Holy Spirit. They referred to the Holy Spirit as a person. Um, let's take a look at John 16 and verse 14. Thanks, Lila. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Thank you very much. So what is the Holy Spirit going to do? The Holy Spirit's going to glorify Jesus. He'll glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Now, can a force, can a non-personal entity take something from somebody to share it with somebody else? Not possible. That's like saying a rock can take something and contribute and hand it over to some, an, another rock. And then that rock do the same thing for the next rock. It's not, not, uh, not going to happen. Here you have the Holy Spirit who is seen as receiving something from Jesus as a person would and then sharing that with others, with humanity. And so we see there the attributes of a person. So the early church believed the Holy Spirit was a person. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, we're going to look at numerous texts this morning. Matthew 28, verse 19, you have the Great Commission. And Jesus said, baptizing them, believers, in the name singular of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's right. And, uh, and you see that crop up again, that idea crop up again in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. We will actually look at that uh, in just a few moments. Now, uh, the, the early church believed that the Holy Spirit was a person. They also believed that he was a personality. He has a personality. For example, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, we're reminded that uh, the pre-flood world, the antediluvian world was wicked and every thought and imagination of the heart was evil continually. And God said in Genesis 6 verse 3 that my spirit will not always, you remember the word? Strive, not, not, uh, not always strive with, uh, with man. Now, if you're striving for something, what are you doing? You're contending, right? You're going after something, you're striving. Uh, an athlete strives to achieve and get a gold medal, not silver, not bronze, although that doesn't, that's not a bad uh, follow-up. They, they strive to, to uh, become all that they can be to reach the, the finish line first. Um, at your workplace, you're striving to accomplish your task. The word strive connected to anything uh, indicates personality, indicates personhood. And so here we're told that the Holy Spirit would not always strive, plead with, contend for the souls of men and women, boys and girls, you see. Um, let's go to Luke chapter 12 and verse 12. Let's take a look at what Jesus said here about the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 12 and verse 12. Notice, he says, For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Of course, Jesus is referring to believers being brought before magistrates and judges. And uh, he says, look, take no thought. The Holy Spirit will teach you what to say in those very moments. Who teaches? Can an inanimate object teach? Can a force teach? No, only a personality, only a person can teach. Right. Um, John chapter 16, verse 8. Let's go over there also. Let's look at the words of Jesus. John 16 and verse 8. 
If we want to understand the work of the Holy Spirit, here is a fantastic um, uh, passage of Scripture from Jesus that speaks about what the Holy Spirit does, what he came into the world to do. One of his main functions, uh, I wouldn't say his only, certainly there are others. But notice John chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus is speaking and he says, when he has come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, when he has come, he will what, friends? Convict. Convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, we're told that the Holy Spirit also directs the affairs of the church. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 26 tells us that the Holy Spirit helps us and intercedes for us while we are praying. And then, of course, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, speaking about the scriptures and holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's exactly right. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 talks about the Holy Spirit sanctifying or making holy a believer, the believer, the one who follows Jesus and trusts in him. And so um, when, we, when we consider how the Holy Spirit functions and what he does, he strives, he teaches, he convicts, he directs, he helps, he intercedes, he inspires, and he sanctifies. It's important to highlight these functions because they, because they help us understand that the Holy Spirit cannot merely be a force or a power or an attribute of God. Only a person can do all of these things that we just looked at. Only a person can strive and teach and help and intercede and direct and inspire and sanctify. So the Holy Spirit, no question. I don't think we have any question this morning. Holy Spirit is a person. But is he God? Is he God? Is he equal with the Father and is he equal with the Son? And we looked at that last week, but I want to go over a few things here with you to, as a way to review. This is very important for us to understand uh, for, for multiple reasons. Number one, because... Christianity seems to stand alone in the, in the midst of multiple religions throughout the world um, in its understanding of the triune God, the Trinity, that there is the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, there are, now, within Christianity, there are varying versions of that. And there are even Christians, of which we've already mentioned, that do not believe that the Holy Spirit is God, is the third person of the Godhead. And sadly, even within the Seventh-day Adventist church, there is a growing movement where people are referring to certain uh, um, pioneer writings back in the early days where individuals didn't quite fully see or fully understand that the Holy Spirit was, is God. And so they take some of these writings and they believe that that's what we ought to be believing today. But the church grew and our pioneers developed as they continued to study the Word of God. And they saw that Jesus Christ was the only begotten of the Father. He was God in human flesh. And they understood, came to understand that the Holy Spirit was the third person of the Godhead. As a matter of fact, Ellen White wrote multiple times about the powerful working of the Holy Spirit and referred to him as the third person of the Godhead. And so to suggest that we should go back to what some of our earlier pioneers believed as they were coming out of the various faiths and religions of the day, uh, would not be standing, would be putting us in a place contrary to Scripture. And so it's important that we understand this issue from that perspective and also from the perspective that, that if, if the Holy Spirit is God and yet we consider him to be a force, uh, just an attribute of God to be used by us, then we rob divinity, we rob God of the deference, the honor that is due to him as a holy being, as, as God. So is he God? The Bible views the Holy Spirit as God. There is no question about that. Uh, go with me to Acts chapter 5, if you'd be so kind. Acts chapter 5. And you remember, this is the story when uh, we have the situation of a, uh, of a couple, Ananias and Sapphira, and they, uh, they committed a certain portion of their of their, uh, their land sale to the ministry of the church, the work of the gospel, and yet they kept some of it back. And when you read the story there, Peter confronts Ananias, and notice what he says in verses 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to who? The Holy Spirit. 
and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own? in your own control. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but who, friends? God. Do you see there? You lied to the Holy Spirit. And then he says, you've not lied to men, but to God. And so right there, you see, uh, Peter understands that the Holy Spirit is, is God. Now, also from just the fact that he says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, you know that we're dealing with a person. You can't lie to a rock or a tree, or at least it doesn't at least sense that or know that. Um, you are lied to a person. But here Peter says, you've lied to God. So Peter understood that the Holy Spirit and God were one. Um, let's see here. Uh, also in Matthew chapter 12, <clears throat> uh, there Jesus said, you know, if you're not for me, you're against me. And he talked about uh, all manner of sin will, will, will God forgive you. But blasphemy against whom? Do you remember? The Holy Spirit. That's right. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven you. That's the unpardonable sin. The sin that a person does not want pardoned because they don't want to give it and hand it to God. They don't want to repent of it and confess it and hand it to him, you see. So stubbornly resisting, stubbornly refusing to uh, surrender to the Holy Spirit. So um, so here, here, uh, Jesus talks about blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. And you can only blaspheme against the Holy Spirit if the Holy Spirit is God. Right, exactly. All right. There are also, when you read the scriptures, there are also divine attributes that are associated with the Holy Spirit that lead you to the conclusion to know that the Holy Spirit is God. There are divine attributes associated with the Holy Spirit. Um, let's look at several together. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Um, and someone has 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. Okay, Pam, we'll come over to you in just a quick moment. So Romans chapter 8, verse 2. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life is in Christ Jesus, has made me free from the law of sin and death. So the Holy Spirit is life. Did you see that? The Holy Spirit is life. Over on John chapter 16, verse 13. We'll just flip over there real quick. John chapter 16 and verse 13. I want you to notice Jesus is speaking. He says, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. And so here we're told that the Spirit is truth. He is not a part of truth. He is truth. Just as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you see. And so the Holy Spirit is seen as truth. Uh, over in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, we're told that the Holy Spirit sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, let me ask you a question. How can anything less than God pour out the love of God into our hearts? Is that possible? No, only one with God who knows the love of God, who is love, can share that love with others. And in this case, with humanity. And so here we see another divine attribute of the Holy Spirit. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it talks there about the, the Holy Spirit not, gr not uh, um, grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Um, he is omnipotent. And according to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, he distributes spiritual gifts. Pam, I'll let you read that for us if you don't mind. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. One of the clearest texts in scriptures that tell us that the Holy Spirit is a person. Here he determines for himself who gets what spiritual gift. Did you see that? He makes the decision. He figures it out. He says, okay, you're getting this gift, you're getting this gift, or you're getting these gifts. And he determines and distributes according to his own determination, according to his own will. Now, in John 14 and verse 16... Uh, it reads, Jesus is saying, speaking, he says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. 
And so the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, abiding with the people of God forever. And then over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10, 11, we won't turn there, but you can just write that down. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10, 11. He is omniscient and he knows the deep and hidden things of God. Now, only God knows the deep and hidden things about himself. And if we knew those th- deep and hidden things about God, then guess who we would be? Yeah, we, would be we would be God. And that's not the case. And we know that. We just need to look inside our hearts and we already know that. Uh, but here, we're told, but Paul writes and says that the Spirit knows the deep things of God. So the Holy Spirit is a person. He is God. He has the attributes of divinity of God. And uh, the works of God also are connected with the Holy Spirit. The works of God are also connected with the Holy Spirit, helping us see that the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, For example, creation and the resurrection both involve the Holy Spirit. Uh, In Job chapter 33 and verse 4, it says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. And then David, he piggybacked on this in Psalm 104 verse 30, where he says, You send your Spirit... And they are created. And so the Holy Spirit is an active agent in creation, was an active agent in creation. Um, And we need to remember that it takes God, not an impersonal force, presence or power, to bring Christ to Mary. For Christ to be conceived in Mary's womb. And remember at Pentecost, the Spirit also made Jesus very real to all of those willing recipients in the upper room. Um, So the works of God are connected also with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also considered to be equal with God the Father and God the Son in several places. First of all, uh, we have the baptismal formula. And by the way, someone has 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 through 6. Who's got that? Ray, we'll come to you in just a quick moment. You remember in Matthew 28 verse 19, baptizing them in the name singular of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Also, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are seen uh, as equals in the apostolic blessing. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to get to 1 Corinthians in just a moment, but let's go to 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. Notice this, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. It says, and this is the apostolic blessing, it says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And so the three are considered and seen as one through the eyes lens of the inspired writer. And then also the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son are seen as one in the spiritual gifts passage uh, that Ray, you're going to read for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit... There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Did you see that? There are diversities of gifts, differences of ministries, diversities of activities, but it's the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God. Did you see that? All three in one, pronounced in uh, this spiritual gifts passage. So from eternity... The Holy Spirit lived within the Godhead as the third member. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equally self-existent. And though equal, each is equal, uh, an economy of function operates within the Godhead. Each has a particular function. Perhaps the best way to understand the truth of the Holy Spirit is to see Him working and His life through Jesus. You see, when the Holy Spirit comes... The Holy Spirit doesn't come in his own right. You remember Jesus said, I'm going to send him. He's going to tell you whatever I tell him. He's he's not going to come in his own right. He's not going to carry his own credentials. He doesn't come along and says, pray to me. He doesn't say, worship me. He doesn't say, come to me. He doesn't say, live for me. He doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit's activity in history has and does and always will center in Christ's mission of salvation to the world. The Holy Spirit was actively involved At Christ's birth, without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't have a Savior, you see, God in human flesh. 
Jesus' ministry was confirmed. His public ministry was confirmed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. He descended in the form of a dove. That's right. And then uh, brought the Holy Spirit brought the reality of Christ's atoning sacrifice and resurrection to humanity. And you can read that in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. So the Holy Spirit uh, doesn't come with its own credentials. He preaches, he directs, he invites and points people to the ministry of Jesus Christ. It seems the scripture indicates that the Spirit's role is one of executor. One of executor. When the Father gave the Son to the world, he was conceived, as we mentioned earlier, by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to complete the plan, came to make the plan of salvation a reality for men and women, boys and girls here on planet Earth. He was present at creation, and his intimate involvement is clearly highlighted in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. The Spirit of God was upon the face of the waters, you understand. You read that there in Genesis 1 verse 2. Life's origin and life's maintenance depends on his operation. His departure from this world would mean death to everything. The Bible says that if God should gather himself, his spirit, I'm reading now Job 34 verses 14 and 15. If God should gather himself, his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to the dust. So the Holy Spirit is an active agent in sustaining life here on planet Earth. And then someone has Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. We're going to go there, Richard. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. We also see reflections of the Spirit's creative work within each person who opens themselves up to God. As I mentioned before, who can share the love of God except God himself? Uh, The fullness of God's love, that is. We can share it in part, but the Holy Spirit shares the fullness of God's love. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. When you're ready, Richard, thank you. Now, hope does not disappoint Mm -hmm. because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Amen. So the Holy Spirit brings the reality of the love of God, the reality of the gospel to whom? To us. He makes it real. God sends the Son. The Son sends the Spirit. The Spirit brings to reality the atoning sacrifice of Jesus and what Jesus is doing for us in the sanctuary above as our high priest. Now, the Holy Spirit has been an active agent in the creation of the world, Christ's incarnation and man's recreation. The scripture ultimately points to him as a, the promised spirit. I'm not going to get too much into this because there's going to be a lesson on this coming up, but let me just briefly explain. We were intended to be the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Adam and Eve sin separated them from the garden and the indwelling of the spirit. And the separation today, of course, continues. The enormity, enormity of wickedness before the flood led God to declare, my spirit shall not always strive with man. In the Old Testament, the Spirit equipped certain individuals to perform certain tasks. You remember, he even inspired Balaam. He he inspired Gideon and Samson and Saul. And at times, he is uh, actually described as being a person, being in the persons of, uh, of individuals, such as the case of the skilled worker Basileel, who made some of the furniture of the sanctuary. And even in the Israelites, as they were wandering through the wilderness, there's no question that the believers have always had an awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit. But prophecy predicts that a great pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh will manifest, be manifested. Uh, And um, and that would bring in a new era. Of course, that we can find that we can find that uh, prophecy in Joel chapter two, verse twenty eight. So while the hand remains in the hands of the world remains in the hands of the usurper, the pouring out of the fullness of the Spirit had to wait. It had to wait. But wait for what? What did it have to wait for? Before the Spirit could be poured out upon all flesh, Christ needed to carry out his earthly ministry and his atoning sacrifice. Pointing to Christ's ministry, a spirit ministry, John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water, but he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Just hours before Jesus' death, remember Jesus promised his disciples, I'll pray the Father and I'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. But when did the promise of the Spirit come? 
When did the promise of the Spirit come? He wasn't received when Jesus died on crucifixion Friday because there was only darkness and there was only lightning. We know that. It wasn't until the resurrection did Jesus breathe his Spirit. Remember, he blew on his disciples. He breathed his Spirit on the disciples in John 20, verse 22. And he said, Behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you endued or endowed with power from on high. And in Acts, Luke states that that power came in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. So in John chapter 7, verse 39, Jesus, John wrote, the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now he was always present, but the need of the Holy Spirit wasn't a reality unless Christ was removed. Because while Christ was present, who would need anything else, right? And so John wrote that the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus wasn't glorified. In other words, the accepting of Christ's sacrifice by the Father was the prerequisite for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So Christ's sacrifice needed to be approved and accepted by the Father. And then when that happened, that new age broke in when our victorious Lord was seated on the heaven's throne. And only then could he send the Holy Spirit in all its fullness. In Acts chapter 2, we read, Being exalted to the right hand of God, this is Peter speaking, he poured out the Holy Spirit upon his disciples who were anxiously awaiting and anticipating the event. They were in one accord, in one place, in supplicating the throne of God. At Pentecost, 50 days after Calvary, that new age burst forth with all the Holy Spirit's power. And suddenly, this is Acts 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a sound of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where the disciples were sitting and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. What a powerful uh, introduction of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament era. The mission, friends, of both Jesus and the Holy Spirit were totally interdependent. The fullness of the Spirit could not be given until Jesus had completed his mission. And Jesus, in turn, was conceived of the Holy Spirit, baptized by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, performed miracles by the Spirit, offered himself on Calvary through the Spirit, and was in part resurrected by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was the first person to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and he gives you and I the Holy Spirit as well as we open our hearts to him. I want to read several statements in closing our class, our lesson today from the spirit of prophecy. Some of them, uh, all of them are pretty powerful. That's why I want to share them with you. They talk about the, they talk about the Holy Spirit being the third person of the Godhead. But I want you to notice more importantly what the Holy Spirit can do in your life, in my life. I'm going to read, first of all, from Desire of Ages. This is from page 805. I want you to notice. She says, the Holy Spirit is the breath of spiritual life to the soul. Now, if you and I quit breathing, would we live very long? We wouldn't. The Holy Spirit is the breath of spiritual life to the soul. If Without the Holy Spirit, you and I would be dead spiritually. It's the Holy Spirit that brings life and sustains life, spiritual life in us. She goes on to say the impartation or the giving of the Spirit, notice this, is the impartation of the life of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? It's the impartation of the life of Christ. It imbues the receiver with the attributes of Christ. Now, again, only one that is God can share what belongs to God. And here we're told that when the Holy Spirit comes into the life of the believer, he brings into the believer's life the attributes, the character of Jesus Christ. That's powerful stuff. You want a new character? You want to be changed? The Holy Spirit is the answer. Now, this is from 669 of the same book, Desire of Ages. It's my, my, uh, my favorite spirit of prophecy book. The Holy Spirit, she says, is Christ's representative, but divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was for their interest, the disciples, that he should go to the Father and send the Spirit to be his successor on earth. No one could then have any advantage because of his location or his personal contact with Christ. Now, now listen to this. By the Spirit, the Savior would be accessible to all 
in this sense, he would be nearer to them than if he had not ascended on high. Isn't that powerful? So when Jesus left, he sent the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit can minister to each of us at any time, at any place across this globe. Jesus could only minister to one person at a time because he was a human being, God in flesh. Yet he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us so that we might have the presence of Christ with us until we die or until Jesus comes back. And his being with us is better, it seems, than if Christ had not ascended on high. This is powerful. A lot of people don't consider the person of the Holy Spirit is like having Jesus with you each and every day. You want Jesus with you every day? Pray for the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life. Brings Christ. Now, uh, this is from Testimonies to Ministers. And even though it's to ministers, it's for all of us. Page 392. Ellen White says, Evil had been accumulating for centuries and could only be restrained and resisted by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. And then she goes on to say, The third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified or limited energy, but in the fullness of divine power. You want power, dunamis power, dynamite power in your life? Sin to be broken up, exploded in your life? Then ask for the Holy Spirit in your heart. He doesn't come with limited energy, but with the fullness of divine power. And why not? Why not? He is God after all, right? He comes and imbues us with power, with the attributes of God. And then this is the last one that I'll share with you is from Special Testimonies, Series B, number seven, page 62 and 63. You can get the DVD afterwards to hear that again. Here it is. The comforter that Christ promised the Holy Spirit to send after he ascended to heaven is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead. Now, it's interesting. Just prior to her saying that, she says that in Christ was all the fullness of the Godhead. In the Father was all the fullness of the Godhead. And then she says, in the Comforter, in the Spirit, is all the fullness of the Godhead. In Ellen White's mind, is the Holy Spirit God? Yes, absolutely. Of course, too, she's inspired. And the Holy Spirit is inspiring her to let folk know the Holy Spirit is God. So the Spirit is in all the fullness, the Godhead making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal savior. Uh, She goes on to say, there are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized. And these powers, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ Jesus. So not only do we have the Holy Spirit aiding us and helping us and empowering us, but all three are for us. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all working with us as we, to, as we uh, seek to and strive to uh, live out in some small way the life of Jesus Christ. The astounding truth today, friends, the astounding truth about the Holy Spirit is simply this, that the Lord is willing to pour out His Spirit on everybody who earnestly desires Him. And if there's anything you're going to take away from today, take away that. That that same Holy Spirit that imbued Jesus Christ, the same Holy Spirit that brought Christ into the world, that affirmed his ministry at his baptism, that infused his life. Remember Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, to preach the gospel to the poor, etc. The same Holy Spirit that imbued Christ when he walked this sod is the same Holy Spirit that God is wanting to pour out into yours and into my life. So the question for us this morning is, is that your desire? Is that your earnest desire to seek the Holy Spirit, to seek, that he, seek God that he might pour out his spirit into your heart and into your life? Of course, when the Holy Spirit comes, that means more of him and less of me. That's what it means. It means more of the power of God 
and less of my brokenness and of my weakness, trusting in his divine power to sustain me and to keep me as I seek to walk with Jesus. So take that truth away with you today, that God wants to pour out the Holy Spirit upon you as it was poured out upon Jesus. What a wonderful God we serve. What do you say? We have power to help us and aid us in this walk, in this world. And we can trust God and thank him for the wonderful gift of the person of the Holy Spirit, the mighty third person of the Godhead, just in case you didn't hear it. Want to make sure you got it again. The mighty third person of the Godhead. Don't forget to call in for the free offer. It's offer C21704. Uh, call us at 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org and we'll be happy to get this presentation out to you in CD or DVD format. Let us know which one and don't forget to give us your full address and, um, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a blessed week. Go in peace. God bless.